let's welcome Christopher in Rediscovering Lincoln. All right, so I call this a uh, Rediscovering Lincoln uh, for, for many reasons. And you, you'll learn that as we, as we go through this. Uh, and, uh, but the subtitle for it is When Art, Technology, and History Collide. Uh, and in many ways, it was also uh, how they come together accidentally. And so we're, we're going to cover that <laughs> as well uh, in this uh, talk. So uh, let me go ahead and get started. Um, so the lecture has several components to it. And uh, it's partly a look at how a particular iconic image of a very iconic man um, has captured the imagination of generations of people throughout the years and all over the world. Um, it's also a bit of an under the hood look at uh, the Virtual Lincoln Project, which Phil mentioned earlier. Uh, and as he said, it's an undergraduate research project uh, that's um, in which I've been leading for several years at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. Uh, and uh, finally, this lecture is going to cover uh, some of the journey of discovery uh, that my students and I have had uh, and that we've been on uh, since this project began. Um, and as I said, I, I hope in the end we'll have a, a uh, chance to discuss how art, technology, and research can come together uh, to not only recreate moments in history, but also maybe solve a few mysteries uh, along the way. Uh, so let's get going. So on November 8th, 1863, uh, John Hay, one of Abraham Lincoln's secretaries, wrote the following in his journal. Went, to went with Mrs. Ames to Gardner's Gallery and were soon joined by Nico and the president. We had a great many pictures taken, some of the president, the best I have seen. Nico and I immortalized ourselves by having ourselves done in a group with the president. So as you can see here, that's, uh, that's Nicola and Hay obviously posing with Abraham Lincoln at that uh, session, which was just days before the Gettysburg uh, dedication ceremony for the, the Soldiers National Cemetery. Now, uh, this is one of five known photographs from that session. And we can, Abraham Lincoln uh, posing with them, of course, and, and whoops, I'm gonna get back onto my lower screen here. Um, and here are a, a couple other photographs from that session. And of course, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this. A lot of people think Matthew Brady, or give Matthew Brady credit for uh, almost all of Lincoln's photos, but it was actually Alexander Gardner, a former Brady employee, uh, who immortalized the president the most, and I would argue the best. Now, the Mrs. Ames uh, that uh, Hay is referring to was Sarah Fisher Ames, uh, who was the wife of a prominent painter, and she herself was a sculptor. And Ames had been commissioned by Congress while Lincoln was president to sculpt the bust of Lincoln that was going to be used in the Capitol building. And uh, while Lincoln agreed to sit for her, um, historian Harold Holzer says that Ames was there to direct the photography of two reference images she really needed uh, to complete her sculpture. One of these photographs is the full length uh, left facing or the, the left facing uh, profile of Lincoln that's from uh, head to waist. And uh, the other oh, is, um, oops, did I skip one? Yeah, and then the other is uh, this full-length uh, front-facing photograph. And although Ames had measured uh, Lincoln's head with calipers and he had agreed to sit for her and everything, uh, she felt this photograph and the profile would give her the most accurate uh, reference of Lincoln's face and upper torso. And when, when we see that photograph, we don't often see uh, the full image. We, we see it usually cropped in quite a bit. Now this is the plaster copy of the resulting sculpture. And I believe this one belonged actually to Harold Holzer uh, who sold it recently at an auction. Uh, and this is the photo that most of us know. It was used as, uh, it was supposed, as I said, it was supposed to be a reference photo, uh, but when Gardner cropped it and went in on the image quite a bit, he realized he had taken this really quite stunning portrait of Lincoln. It was very unusual in, uh, for any portraits being done at that time. And the photograph was immediately pop popular, and, uh, and I would argue it has become probably one of the most recognized photographs of all time. It is so iconic an image 
uh, that artists of all stripes and styles throughout the years have been reproducing it. So I wonder what, what is our need to see this particular pose reproduced over and over and over and over? And what does it project that we just can't get enough of? Now, ever since his death, which uh, you know we're going to be uh, observing in just a few days, ever since his death, uh, every subsequent generation has had this craving uh, to see a living Lincoln in their time. And they've used various methods uh, to bring him to life, such as film, as we see here. We see all the various portrayals, uh, famous portrayals of Lincoln on stage, television, film, also in literature and art. Oops. And of course, not all <laughs> not all portrayals are especially reverent uh, of, of Lincoln. Um, but there are others uh, for whom a love of Lincoln is actually their livelihood. And that would be the Association of Lincoln Presenters. Now, uh, throughout the years, uh, men have taken on Lincoln's persona and appearance in order to educate and entertain. And the Association of Lincoln Presenters formed as a group and they meet uh, as, for a conference every year. And in 2018, they met at Freeport, Illinois, uh, where they ended up playing baseball on a miniature Wrigley Field. Uh, I attended this particular conference to do research for a book that I'm writing, and I shot some video of this game. And I'm just going to show you a little clip of it that I think, think is pretty funny. Uh, here we go. To the wall. Here comes the other Lincoln coming around third. That ball is still. Oh, that Lincoln is missing. Here comes the Lincoln home. Oh no, he's going to fall. Oh no, he is. Oh, he saved by a hat. <laughs> now, I posted that video on Facebook and it kind of went viral. <laughs> uh, I didn't expect that. Uh, it ended up getting hundreds of shares and tens of thousands of views and likes. Uh, and, um, but it was fascinating for me to go to this conference and, and meet and interview all these uh, men. And, and also, by the way, there are lots of women there who play Mary Lincoln. Um, and they all come from different walks of life. They have different levels of education. Um, but for each one of them, Lincoln uh, represents an ideal. Now, one of the earliest Lincoln presenters, whoops, here we go again, was Walt Disney. Now, even as a young man, Disney idolized Lincoln. Here he is, that's him on the right, uh, with his best friend, I think it's Walt Pfeiffer is his name. Uh, Walt made this stovepipe hat out of cardboard, and he glued on this false beard and went to his classroom and delivered the Gettysburg Address from memory. And the school principal was so impressed with Walt's delivery that every year on the anniversary of the address, uh, Walt had to put on the hat and the beard and go from classroom to classroom to deliver the speech. Now, Disney's obsession uh, with uh, Lincoln actually never went away. And, and the pioneering work in audio animatronics uh, that Walt's Imagineers were doing uh, for New Land attractions uh, inspired him to create a living Lincoln uh, for the New York World's Fair in, 18, in 1964. Um, well, the results weren't exactly lifelike, <laughs> uh, but they were convincing enough uh, that many of the spectators actually threw coins at Lincoln uh, to see if he was a real actor uh, playing the part. Uh, and by the way, the attraction was so popular at the World's Fair, Walt had another Lincoln built quickly and installed it in Disneyland before the World's Fair was even over. The world has never had a good definition of the word liberty. And the American people just now are much in want of one. We all declare for liberty. But in using the same word, we do not all mean the same thing. So yeah, um, I think uh, you know I, this would be an interesting discussion to have if we have time at the end to 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 talk about um, why this might be, why this image, why this man, uh, and why now, and, you know, and, and why does it keep happening? 
Um, so that's that's uh, the first part of this that I wanted to, to cover, just to, to give you a little backstory on what we're doing now. So um, what we're doing now is this. Uh, so I had the typical, I don't know how many of you teach, uh, but uh, back in 2013, I was facing a problem that pretty much most teachers experience at some point. Uh, and that was, I was uh, teaching a, a very complicated uh, computer animation and modeling software uh, called Maya to my animation students. And the problem I had was, which is typical of all teachers, is some students get it at the pace that I expect. Uh, some never really get it. Uh, and then there are other students who get it right away or get it fairly quickly. And they tend to get bored uh, because they have to sit around and wait for everybody else to catch up. So what do you do with those students? What do you do? How do you, how do you keep them fed? So my solution was uh, to create uh, the Virtual Lincoln Project as an undergraduate research endeavor. And our goal was to digitally create a photoreal human being. Uh, but just to make it harder, I decided let's make it somebody that everybody knows. Let's make it a face that everybody knows. Uh, and then let's animate him. Oh, I don't know, uh, doing something like delivering the most famous speech in American history. So uh, that's what we did. We started that off and the students decided they wanted to go it alone. They wanted to do their own thing without any help from me. <laughs> and, and, um, and I said, okay, here's some rope. And, uh, and well, they didn't really achieve the goal. Uh, the first Lincoln they created uh, looked like this and we call it Game Lincoln uh, because it might work in a video game if it's you're you know 100 feet away in the game uh, but we knew this was not going to meet any expectations of a photoreal digital lincoln so i said let's go back to let's go back to the source and uh, we started over and decided to use the man himself uh, and i'm sure you recognize this life cast uh, it's the original life cast uh, that's at the smithsonian museum that sculptor leonard volk took of uh, lincoln uh, in uh, Chicago in 1860, before he grew his beard. Uh, the hand casts are also uh, from that, although Volk, I believe, went down to Springfield to get those. And, um, but as you can see, the detail in, these, in this mask is just off the charts uh, <laughs> and incredible. Uh, every pore, every wrinkle, every fold, all there. Now, what's really cool is over the last few years, uh, the Smithsonian has digitally scanned that life mask, and you can download it. You can go to their website and download that and other digital scans of things in their collection. And I did that and I took their scan and I put it in Maya and lit it and rotated it so that you can see what you've got there. And um, so, you know, I recommend that to anybody who's interested in doing so. Um, they're just fun to look at. And uh, now these are two uh, plaster copies of the Lincoln Life cast that I own. And uh, the Volk mask, of course, from 1860. And, uh, and the other one is the Mills mask, which was taken in 1865, uh, when uh, just a few months before Lincoln's assassination. And I also managed to get a hold of the hands as well. Um, so this is an image of, or a couple of images of two of my students scanning um, the, uh, the uh, life cast in order to get uh, a digital model that we could work with. Uh, this was long before the Smithsonian put the other model available for people to download. And um, so here's the result. These are the, uh, these are the, light, the scans, the digital scans of the light yes. uh, that I own. And what's remarkable to me when you compare these side by side is, is just how detail, uh, detailed they are, especially the one on the right. Uh, the, for the, the, the 1861, of course, he's missing eyes. Uh, and there's many theories about why that is. Um, but, but, uh, but you can also see how much the man aged with five years of war. Um, so uh, I, I, really, I really just love seeing those two images together. And we knew that our optimal Lincoln was going to be smack dab right in the middle of those two uh, ages. So what we did was we took those scans what we did was we took those scans uh, in, into a digital sculpting program uh, called Mudbox, where you can literally be like a sculptor and build up and shave away and do all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and um, so we brought it into Mudbox, and that allowed us to, to add all this digital detail, such as like the veins uh, on his 
on his temple and things like that. There's just a hint of them on the life casts, but, but I knew that it was going to be a little bit more needed there. I'm watching something on my computer. Um, yes. So um, the results of the scans uh, and all, adding all that uh, detail uh, brought us a little closer uh, to a lifelike Lincoln. It's not there yet. It's still somewhere in the uncanny valley, and I can explain what that is if anybody needs an explanation later. Um, and and uh, but but it's getting there. We we were much happier uh, with that. And um, so he looks a little more lifelike. We we got really inspired at this point and thought, wow, this is this this actually may work. Um, and. Uh, so we also decided at this point to uh, take it out for a test drive. <laughs> and uh, this is a proof of concept test uh, in which our digital Lincoln stands next to me at UNCA. And what we were doing is we we're trying to see how our digital character stacks up against a real human. And while we decided this was promising, we thought it needed more work. He looks fairly stiff. Uh, you know, the skin needs a lot more lushness to it, uh, various things like that. Um, but the school published this on our, our school webpage, and uh, I soon got several emails from both students and faculty asking if they could go pose with our statue uh, before we took him down in the quad. And so I, I had a good laugh about it, and I told our students, well, clearly we're fooling some of the people some of the time. So um, now our initial plans uh, were to have Lincoln deliver the address uh, as a sole figure standing on a speaker's platform or against a neutral uh, gray backdrop. But as you can see from this uh, test image, uh, that ended up looking kind of strange to us. So we, we, we just kind of felt we needed to put this whole thing in context and add the scene, which means adding a crowd of 15,000 people. Uh, it means adding dozens of people on the speaker stand. Um, and it means adding the cemetery and distant Gettysburg in the distance and Culp's Hill and all and the and the uh, the, the Gettysburg uh, the Evergreen Cemetery Gatehouse. I mean, it means adding all of this stuff. Uh, and so what happened was our project grew in size and scope, and we unknowingly or unwittingly, I should say, uh, added uh, several years uh, to the project by doing that by making that decision. Um, and what was clearly also uh, a, evident to us at that time was that we were going to have to do a ton of research <laughs> on, on the dedication ceremony um, of the Soldiers National Cemetery and uh, because we need to get the history right. The last thing we wanted was to get out there with our video, put it online, have people watching it and have somebody say, well, that's not right. <laughs> so so we, we really got serious about uh, the research end of it. So while the students continue to work on the tech, and iterate on Lincoln and make him look better. I began the deep dive into researching uh, the event and, the, and also the Gettysburg uh, that existed on November 19th, uh, 1863. So uh, the first books I found actually were, uh, were uh, ones that captivated me and, and it actually changed the focus of my research. And those are by uh, Bill Frazzanito. Uh, and as you can see, it's uh, Gettysburg, A Journey in Time and Early Photography at Gettysburg. And uh, as many of you know, Frazzanito the, is the top expert of uh, photography in the Civil War. Uh, and his research blazed trails for uh, researchers interested uh, in analyzing uh, the photographic record uh, in order to glean uh, information about what actually happened at the ceremony. Uh, and 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 uh, also in the war and everything like that. So what what actually happened, how it happened, and where it happened. Now, one of the mysteries that Frazzanito was really determined to solve and spent years working on was where was Lincoln standing when he delivered the Gettysburg Address. If you've ever traveled to Gettysburg, and I assume most of you have, uh, you'll notice that there is no marker for the exact location of where the Lincoln spoke. Uh, and that's because it was poorly documented. Nobody expected Lincoln to deliver the most famous speech in American history, so they didn't document it very well. And over the past 158 years, uh, several witnesses to the event, including a guy named Washington Yates Selleck, who was one of the commissioners, 
um, or actually, I think he was one of the, the marshals um, from Wisconsin. Uh, he was the guy responsible for designing the speaker's platform. And those people and he, they all had placed the stand at various places within the, socials, the soldiers' uh, national cemetery. And over time, the commonly accepted wisdom was that the speaker's platform uh, was where the soldiers' national monument now stands on that little rise in the ground there. Now, Frazzanito ended up raising eyebrows when after several years of exhaustive research, uh, he announced that the speaker's platform was not in the Soldiers National Cemetery, as most people thought, uh, which, by the way, Lincoln was there to dedicate, uh, but was actually uphill uh, from the monument and inside the privately owned Evergreen Cemetery, which was new at the time. And, uh, and that, of course, was famous for its iconic gatehouse. And uh, which, by the way, still stands today, although there's a house built onto it now. Uh, both cemeteries occupy Cemetery Hill, uh, which saw some of the fiercest fighting during the three-day battle of Gettysburg. And uh, a fence now separates them, but at the time there was no fence. And also, by the way, whenever I go to Gettysburg, I sleep in the gatehouse. Um, and if someone cares, they can ask me about that later. Uh, so um, now based on a combination of written accounts, uh, as well as his analysis of the slim, and it is slim, photographic record of the event. Uh, Frasinito placed the speaker's platform uh, where these graves now stand within Evergreen Cemetery. And Frasinito's ID of this location uh, quickly gained a lot of support among historians and, and buffs, and it remains the most accepted likely location of the Gettysburg Address today. In fact, when you go to the cemetery, you'll often see people with his book in hand trying to find uh, this space. And um, now others have placed it within Evergreen as well uh, since then, but Frasinito's location seems pr pretty likely or seems to be the most likely, uh, at least uh, until I started doing my research. Um, so uh, this, uh, in 2013, I, I arranged for my team of uh, undergraduate students uh, to visit uh, Gettysburg in order to get a real feel uh, for the place that they're trying to digitally recreate. Uh, and so we spent several hours exploring both the cemeteries and uh, here we are marking off uh, Frasinito's location uh, to see if it fits uh, what we're building back in North Carolina. And we also uh, toured the battlefields and got a, an extensive tour of the the cemeteries and the town of Gettysburg uh, from Chuck Teague, shown here on the right, uh, who's of course of the National Park Service. He's recently retired. But it wasn't all work, of course. Uh, so, you know, uh, we'll come back uh, to the research part of this um, in a moment, um, uh, just for the sake of clarity and trying to finish off one thing and not keep coming back and forth. Uh, I wanna just finish off where we ended up with the Lincoln Project uh, and, and where we currently are. Uh, so let's go ahead here. So of course, um, every semester, some team members will roll off the team and some of the new ones will roll on. And uh, so the, the team changes constantly. So for Lincoln 3.0, we're, we're gonna get, get some more students in here. And, um, but the technology also changes. So something we were using uh, for the beginning of the project suddenly is now out of date or there's something better that's, that can be used. So that keeps happening as well as too. So every team that comes on thinks they can do better than the previous team. So what happens? We end up starting over. Now, uh, this is a, an animation uh, test. Uh, and this is the rig uh, that we use to animate Lincoln. So uh, the, the uh, the, the rig is actually kind of the skeleton of the character. And, and it allows the animators to uh, move our Lincoln around uh, and bring him to life. And uh, so there he was jumping up and down in his long johns. Um, so um, that was before we had a suit for him. So um, what we did next to try to really get a little more accurate on what we were doing was we aligned our digital model uh, with photos of Lincoln to serve as reference for accurately placing his beard and his hair. Uh, we felt we, didn't, we weren't close enough on the previous models. And what really surprised and pleased us was how closely the photos and our digital model matched. Uh, it was almost spooky. 
Uh, here's another view of a couple more of these. Uh, we did almost a dozen of these and, and to, ch to check our work and also to get multiple points of reference uh, for this. And then uh, we brought the character back into another more advanced uh, sculpting, digital sculpting tool called ZBrush. And, and we added lots more detail, actually I did. Uh, and we added lots more um, detail to it. You can see here on the right, you can see the, the, the skin texture that I've started putting onto him now. And also making sure that the, the scar that's around his mouth is, is there. And, uh, and that's one thing that I've learned on, on this project is every scar, every mole, everything. Um, so, um, so that's that. Now this is gonna look a little strange. Uh, this is a backscatter map and a skin map, and we call this pelting. What this is, is this wraps around our digital model. And, and uh, you know, think about it as, it as it being projected from a projector onto a surface. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. That's how it actually works. So if you watch a Pixar movie, that's how the characters are, have texture and all of that is because it's being projected onto the 3D model. So, and what was fascinating was I was able to use some high res Lincoln photos to grab his actual skin texture. And so we're actually projecting his own skin onto him, which is kind of freaky. Um, and this is a beard test. Uh, we decided to redo the beard uh, yet again. That, this may have been like the fifth or sixth beard. Um, and uh, so we did that and this was just a test to see how it looked under the light and whether we liked it or not. And uh, they also gave him some new clothes. We modeled a new suit for him, uh, modeled new boots for him, although they're worn boots. I wanted to make sure they were worn boots. And, uh, and you can see how big his feet were, um, but these are modeled after his actual boots. And um, so, and you know, and the, the watch uh, fob and, and everything like that. Uh, we wanted to make sure these are all accurate and that these are the ones he actually wore. And I had the honor of uh, modeling uh, the digitally modeling uh, Lincoln's signature stovepipe hat. And for the record, it's a size uh, seven and an eighth, <laughs> and uh, it's seven inches tall. And I wanted to bring up the seven inches tall bit because every time I see a Lincoln presenter or somebody with a hat that's, you know, three feet tall, I get mad. Uh, so um, it, it's, uh, you know, the height came from Lincoln himself, not the, not the hat. So, um, that was that. So, uh, and these are pieces of, of set that we built uh, for the project. So the gatehouse, uh, his spectacles, uh, we, we had, we, we were putting the photographers in that were there to shoot the photos. So we, we had to create the cameras as well, model the cameras. There was a comfort tent that Edward Everett, the main speaker of the day had to use because he had had a recent stroke and couldn't hold his bladder. So that was actually behind the speaker stand. You can see it in the photos of, of the event. And, uh, and here's just a few animation tests from along the way from uh, various times in the project uh, that I just wanted to give everybody an idea of what we, what we look at when we're working on these. Uh, the left one was the uh, dialogue test to see uh, if we could get some range of facial expression. Uh, the one on the top where he's unfortunately naked is, is uh, but wearing his boots uh, is a, just a camera test uh, just to see um, yeah, how, how we might want to introduce him in the film. And, uh, and then the bottom one is a cloth simulation test just to see how the cloth is moving uh, in, in, in a procedural way. And um, so there's that. And I got to click again. And then just to make it uh, even harder, <laughs> uh, we decided to open our, our video with uh, Lincoln's office in the White House which of course is the cabinet room, now uh, uses the Lincoln bedroom. And um, so uh, our, our film will begin with this room uh, when Lincoln receives the invitation from David Wills uh, to come to Gettysburg to deliver, quote, a few appropriate remarks uh, at the dedication ceremony. And uh, incidentally, we have now created a virtual reality experience inside this room. And where you put the goggles on and you're under, in a VR world, and you get placed in this room with, and we, we researched everything and down to the smallest detail. So that is the carpet that was in there. That, that is the wallpaper that was in there, uh, his desk, everything else, uh, the china, the ink wells, all of that, the fireplace, who's on the, who, what, who, what photographs are on the room, what paintings, all of that's there. 
And, and uh, if there's time at the end, I'll show you a clip uh, from the VR experience uh, that, that's about a minute or so long that, that really shows off that room. Um, and uh, here is where our Lincoln basically ended up before the COVID-19 epidemic uh, put us all on pause for well over a year now. And uh, I'm sure uh, when we start up again, another team's going to decide they can do it better than the last team. Uh, I hope not, because I really don't want to start over again. Um, but uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But this is where we've gotten to. And you can see that is Lincoln's skin texture on his face. Those are his pores. Those are his wrinkles. Um, it's still not photoreal. Uh, and that's a number of tweaks we have to make. Uh, but given game Lincoln at the beginning and getting to this in just a couple years, two or three years, I think, was, uh, was a, a pretty uh, significant accomplishment for the students. And, and I think we're pretty proud of where we got. So that's the virtual Lincoln project. Now I'm going to jump over uh, into uh, the research. And uh, I just got to, you know, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm going to say my, my research uh, for this project uh, just really ended up changing my life. Um, what began with me just trying to figure out who and how many people were on the speaker stand with Lincoln uh, has developed into an absolute obsession. And, uh, and that it's an obsession to, uh, to just learn and, and, and find, find things, but also to get it right. And, um, and I realized fairly quickly uh, when I was doing this research though, that the written record and the photographic record of the dedication ceremony don't really match. Um, and that's a problem. So I tried to figure that I'm, I'm working still to, to figure out where the, the inconsistencies are. Um, the only cl clear visual record we have of the entire scene uh, is this artist etching uh, from Leslie's Illustrated newspaper. Uh, and it shows the entire layout of what occurred that day. And uh, it's seen here from East Cemetery Hill. Uh, and and uh, the artist captured Evergreen Cemetery Great Gatehouse, which you can see it right there. Uh, the 90 foot poplar tree right next to it. And uh, beyond that, you can see a speaker's platform and you can see a flag, uh, the 90 foot flag. And, uh, and you can see that's all taking place uh, in the distant uh, National Soldiers, or Soldiers National Cemetery. And you can also see fresh graves on the right of the image. You can see all the fresh graves that have been dug. Now, when you zoom in on this, uh, you see that uh, um, this is the speaker stand uh, portion of that, of that illustration. And you can see the heads of all the people below uh, the speaker stand. But look at all the people up there. So this in the late 1800s, uh, decades after the fact, uh, William Yates Selleck, uh, who designed the, uh, the, uh, the speaker stand, said it was 12 by 20 feet in size. He also wrote that the dignitaries sat in three rows of chairs with 10 chairs in each row. Lincoln and Edward Everett, who, were the, who was the main speaker of the event, uh, occupied the two center chairs in the front row. But as you can see in this artist's rendering, this platform is much larger <laughs> than 12 by 20 feet. And uh, there are more than 30 people uh, standing on it. So something, something's amiss. And it could be that the artist was embellishing, um, but when we get to the photographs, I don't think so. So let's talk about the photographs. So, and who did them? So uh, I call this the luckiest unlucky photographer. Um, the, the most famous of the six existing photographs taken at the, the dedication ceremony um, has been attributed to uh, David Backrack. And he was uh, positioned about 90 feet in front of the speaker's platform. And there's lots of contemporary accounts of this photographer about 90 feet out in front. And uh, to the right is this 90 foot flagpole uh, that you can see. And that's where the Soldier National Sem Monument uh, now stands, that big monument. On the horizon, uh, you can see the rise of the speaker's platform off to the left there with the flags all around it. And uh, Obviously, that has more than 30 people sitting on it as well, or standing on it. And uh, witnesses described uh, Backrack frantic frantically setting up his camera when Lincoln got up uh, to give his address. And because he wanted to, to you know, and they just sat through two hours of Edward Everett's oration. Uh, so, so Backrack thought he had some time. So he was setting up his camera, getting ready to go. 
And, uh, and uh, by the time he was ready to take the first image, Lincoln finished his speech and sat down. And witnesses said they were, they didn't hear what Lincoln said because they were so busy focused on what Backrack was doing and then laughed when, when, uh, when he uh, started cursing after Lincoln sat. Now, uh, Josephine Cobb was a curator uh, at the National Archives where this photograph was discovered. And she was the first one, it was, it was badly labeled, uh, something like a crowd gathers or something like that. Um, and she was the first one to identify it and say that this was the dedication ceremony at Gettysburg. Uh, and she did this in 1952. But when she was trying to figure out what she was looking at, she enlarged the photo several times. And of course, back then that was a different process, uh, a very mechanical process rather than digital. And uh, so she enlarged the image several, several times and she made a startling discovery. And that was that Abraham Lincoln is seated on the platform surrounded by other dignitaries. Um, and she ends up identifying about 10 of these uh, dignitaries. A few of them she got wrong. Um, and note there again, that there are far more than 30 people on this platform and that many of them are standing uh, and, uh, and not sitting and uh, and there's clearly not only just three rows of chairs on this on this stand. So as I'm struggling to try and figure out what to put in our movie and how to how to make it work, I'm I'm trying to figure out the the geography of all of this. How is this working out? Which way are we facing? Uh, how big is the stand? What shape is the stand? And um, and then I got sick. I got a flu. And what I happened when I, this happened is I, I, I ended up in bed for a couple of days and I got really bored. And so I got my laptop out and I decided to just go online and I grabbed every, I, I had a description of which dignitaries were on the stand. So I went and found contemporary photos of, of all of them and, and uh, the ones who could be found and compared them and did my best to match them with people I could see in this photograph. And, and, uh, and I ended up being able to identify over about 30 of the dignitaries. And here is uh, just a comparison of the various photos of the, of the people uh, being compared to them in their, in their uh, Gettysburg uh, uh, persona as opposed to a studio shot. And um, so um, that was that. So um, now let's talk about another one of the photographers and that was Peter Weaver. Uh, and, um, Two of the photographs of the dedication ceremony came from him. And uh, he was a photographer from Hanover, I think Hanover, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and Bill Frazzanito uh, discovered the photo on the lower right here, uh, which is now owned by a collector named Fred Scherfe. And by the way, Fred gave me permission to use it <laughs> as long as I credit it. Uh, and um, so uh, Frazzanito uh, theorized that this image was taken across the street from uh, a house at the time that was known as the Duttera House, uh, which is no longer there. And it's taken from, he thought it was taken from like the second floor, actually it was taken from an attic, which I can talk about later. I actually found a photo of the Dutter, Duttera House that nobody knew existed in my research. And so now we know what it looked like and, and uh, we know exactly where uh, Weaver took that photo from. And, uh, using the Warren map and all, the, all these other maps uh, of Gettysburg at the time. And uh, so, uh, but in this photo, you can see on the horizon, uh, you can see on the left there, the 90 foot uh, poplar tree. And then if you go to the right, just a bit, you see the gatehouse on the other side there. And then you can see the 90 foot flag. And, and then if you keep going to the right, you see a little rise, you see a dot and then a little rise in the hill. And that's actually the speaker stand. And uh, so, um, we were took this, uh, like I said, from the from the third floor of the uh, of the Duttera House, looking towards Evergreen Cemetery. Um, and then the other photographer uh, who was there was, of course, our friend Alexander Gardner. And so um, he was there uh, taking three photographic, uh, three stereographic uh, images, stereoscopic images of of the. Uh, from the lower left corner, I believe. Yes, the lower left corner of the speaker stand uh, facing uphill from a quite a distance away. Now there's been a lot of speculation as why there was only three shots uh, of this. And, and uh, I would argue that I don't think he intended them to actually be sellable photos. I think these were test prints, uh, test, test images. And we can talk about that later too, if anybody has any uh, questions about that. Um, 
But here you can see in these photographs, you see the, the 90 foot uh, poplar tree way off in the distance. And then you see much closer the, the uh, 90 foot flagpole. Then you see the gatehouse. And then you see the speaker stand on that little rise with the tent, the comfort tent that they put up for Edward Everett uh, right behind it. And by the way, my future grave is right where <laughs> the right corner of that flag or the uh, the tent is. Um, so um, I don't think I've told that to anybody before. So now you're all the first to learn that. Um, so, uh, but I want to go, just talk about one other thing here. So, you know, um, this is one of the more iconic photos, of course, of of the uh, the era, uh, and the body language says everything here um, between these two men. Uh, so, um, and we all know this images, uh, image, and we know lots of the images from the war and, and of Lincoln and everybody else. But what a lot of people don't realize was that actually this was a stereo image. And Gardner shot an awful lot of his photos as, as stereo images. And thousands of photographs in the Civil War were actually taken in stereo. And I, the only reason I'm going on that little digression is I, wanna, I want us to keep in mind that Gardner is shooting stereo photographs at this event. So um, one night I'm in my, uh, doing research in my studio here and I went to the Library of Congress uh, website and I found that you could download in high resolution uh, the, all these photos that they've scanned in, in high detail, high resolution. And with the wet plate photography technique, uh, this isn't, this isn't uh, you know, there's, there's, there's no pixels, there's no uh, silver, there's no nothing in there to, to get grainy on you when you, when you uh, zoom in. Uh, so if it's taken at a high enough resolution, you can just keep zooming in and zooming in and zooming in. Um, so you can download these files uh, and, and actually start just Go, take it into Photoshop and just start going around and looking at everything close up. And uh, this is a blow up of the right side of one of the stereo views. And in the distance, you see the 90 foot poplar, you see the, the gatehouse. Um, and by the way, in that gatehouse, Peter Weaver is in the process of taking a photograph out of that second story window at the same time. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so, um, and you also see here on the right, the speaker stand uh, with all of these people standing on it. Now on the left here, as we zoom in, uh, we, we, we see uh, the spectators perched on top of a buckboard wagon. Uh, the man with his arms folded up there with the, what well, looks like a derby, uh, you know, he's, he's actually sitting on top of a wagon. In the center is another guy with his uh, soldier with his kepi removed and he's looking right at the camera. Um, and uh, that's the actually the left corner, if you're looking at the speaker stand, that's the left corner of it. And sitting right in front of, in front of him, sitting uh, with a hat on, a slouch hat, uh, is, is the designer of the, of the cemetery. And uh, what is happening here is that the, the speaker stand is at an angle to us. So if you look at the right here, you see a little boy on a horse, um, and you see sort of like an edge uh, to to the, these people going up there, and that's that's the right side of the speaker stand. So we know kind of where everybody is at this point. Now, while I was examining this, I happened to suddenly see William A. Seward, the Secretary of State, sitting there, facing forward. And again, this is around two or three in the morning, and. Uh, and I just got all excited and, and out of breath. And, and I was like, oh my God, I just found a photo of Seward that I don't think anybody has seen. And, and I was really proud of myself. And I, and I got really excited about it. And I knew where, Link, where Seward was sitting. He was sitting next to Lincoln. And, uh, and we know that from description and also from uh, this photograph, uh, the back rack photo. And, and uh, so I got excited about it and I, uh, downloaded another one of the stereo views thinking, okay, well, let me see if I can find him in, in the other photos. And so I did, I, I downloaded it. And uh, I also downloaded the right side, which was uh, scanned in very high resolution of, of one of the other photos. I, I just, the, just the right side of it. I, I downloaded that and then zoomed in. And there was Seward again. Uh, but this, as you can see, the image isn't in very good shape. Uh, 
And uh, but this time you see Seward, and now he's turned his head to the right, and and he's looking at something off to the right. Uh, but someone new had entered the photo right next to him, and it was somebody I thought I recognized. And, and again, this was three in the morning and I jumped up on my chair and I did what I call my, my historian happy dance. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I just couldn't believe what I was looking at. And I thought, Is it, could that be Lincoln? And, and um, unfortunately, uh, the Library of Congress uh, hadn't scanned the left side of that stereo image in high resolution. So I, and, and I could see that it was in much better shape and had better contrast. Uh, so so um, it was frustrating, but the, the, the uh, Library of Congress website has a button on it that says, ask a librarian. So I thought, all right, well, I've got nothing else to lose. So I clicked the button and, and, uh, and a window pops up and I said, have you ever scanned in high resolution the left side of image blah, blah, blah. And the next morning I got a, the following response and it says, no, we haven't, would you like us to? <laughs> So uh, I said, yeah, and they said, okay, that'll be $73. Okay, here's my credit card. Um, and with a couple of days later, um, a great gift arrived in my email. And that was high res, very high resolution scan of the left side of the Gardner image. And of course I wasted no time to pull it into Photoshop and, and zoom in. And here I looked at this and I thought, yes, that's him. That's gotta be him. And, and you can see here, he's looking down. Um, now he's on Seward's left in this photograph. Uh, and uh, when in the front photo, you see that he's sitting on Seward's right. So I have lots of theories about why he's where he is, but he is where he should be, which is uh, near Seward and everybody else. Uh, so, uh, but you can see the hint of his beard uh, and you can see the hair is about what the, the, it was cut to uh, just for in advance of that photo shoot 11 days earlier. Uh, the collars are right, the cheekbones are right, the brows are right, the hat is right. Um, so I, I just was pretty convinced. Uh, but to, to make myself even more convinced, I grabbed that profile photo of Lincoln in the, uh, that had been taken 11 days earlier, and I superimposed it in Photoshop on this Lincoln or on this this image to see if everything would line up and it lined up perfectly. Um, so I, I was really excited about this. And but just to double check even more, uh, when I'd been up doing my research uh, on the ground in in uh, Gettysburg, I brought one of the Lincoln life casts so that we would have a light reference of uh, what the light looked like at the time he gave the address 150 years to the day to the hour to the minute of of, uh, of when he was there doing his thing. And so I wanted to get that light reference. Uh, and and uh, so that's what these images are, is, is me doing that. And you can see the gatehouse off in the distance there. So I grabbed this, I grabbed one of the photos I took of the, of the life mask in the lighting condition. And I also laid that over the image. And again, everything matched. The ears, the, the cheekbones, the brow, all of it uh, seemed to, to match pretty perfectly. So um, now, uh, one other thing that came out of this um, was uh, some criticism online when that got published. Uh, the criticism was, well, you know, in, if you look at those images of Seward from the side, you know, he looks like he's sitting in the back row. Well, we, that was a puzzle. We were trying to figure out why would he be sit, look like he's sitting with other people in front of him when we know he sat in the front row. And one of my students, Kenny uh, <laughs> Michelle, said, well, what if it was orchestral seating? And it was one of those jaw-dropping moments where uh, you know we all just went, "Oh my God, yes!" And it, because what would happen is somebody's you know on an arc like that is going to look from the side like they're at the back uh, rather than uh, at, at the front. So we believe very strongly that they were sitting in orchestral seating uh, on the platform. Now, don't be fooled by the size and shape of this platform. It's not accurate. Um, and that's something I will hopefully be revealing this coming November. Um, but we did de determine uh, that that's how they were sitting. Well, of course, uh, this ended up getting some publicity. Uh, the Smithsonian Magazine uh, did a story, as, as uh, was mentioned earlier, they did a story about it and about the Virtual Lincoln Project, and um, which was very exciting for us. 
uh, and and um, also uh, I did 30 interviews that week um, from New York Times to to uh, the, the um, Daily Herald to to all all over the country, all over the world actually, um, and uh, there was just this huge fascination with it. And CBS Evening News ended up sh uh, sending uh, their correspondent Chip Reed down. Uh, and he was uh, doing um, a story on the discoveries and on the virtual Lincoln project. And this ended up being seen by millions of viewers uh, on the actual 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. So I was very proud of that, that uh, you know, the day that they're, they're all doing it uh, at CBS and, and, and paying attention to it, and they got all the ex-presidents to recite the Gettysburg Address. That was all part of the story where they covered this. And I thought that was really quite special. Um, now, what I'm gonna show you is uh, we had to uh, create for the to create our set where all of this is going to happen in the digital world. We have to set. Uh, we have to um, uh, have uh, our, our digital stuff all there. And so this is a. Oops, hang on one second. This is a recording of me describing how we arrive at the the ground that we're going to be putting everything on. This is a 3D modeling program and animation program called Maya. And in it, we can construct items and animate them. What you're looking at right now is a 3D topological map of Gettysburg, and specifically of the Soldiers National Cemetery, which is right here. There's the Gatehouse and, uh, and Evergreen Cemetery beyond. For example, here's Culp's Hill right over here. You can even see the road carved into it. Using GIS maps uh, from the government, top topographic maps, I was able to get an accurate uh, map of the rise and fall of everything in this area. So I can come in here and I can overlay a Google map on top of that. And this gives us a really good idea of where everything is. So that was used uh, and very helpful uh, to, to uh, find out and, and orient ourselves. And uh, so what we did was we knew that certain things hadn't moved. So there was the gatehouse, we knew that hadn't moved. Uh, there was the, uh, uh, we knew where the 90 foot poplar tree was, we knew where the flagpole was, uh, we knew where the speaker stand may have been. Um, and uh, so we, and we had a bit of an idea of where the uh, photographers were. We also knew that where Culp's Hill is because that hasn't changed. And I found on maps where the Duttera house was and, and the, what it looked like. So we recreated that. And, uh, and so what we did was, uh, started putting all of this stuff together in that world, in that environment. And what I wanna point out here is, if you notice the uh, gatehouse off in the distance there, you've got Peter Weaver taking a shot out of there. You've got on the right, you have um, Gardner taking a photograph from a platform uh, looking the other direction. And you have Weaver taking it from across the street down right in front of us, also as well as the gatehouse. And you have back rack 90 feet in front of the speaker stand uh, taking a photo there. So what that gives us is they're all they're all triangulating each other. So every view we have of this ceremony is from a different place, which allows us to take it into our digital world and use our digital cameras in order to recreate the, the space. And the idea was if we could recreate the photos as they exist and make it look exactly the same in our digital world, then we have to have it right. And if they work from all views mathematically, it means that we know where the speaker stand is, how big it is, what shape it is, and more importantly, where Lincoln was standing when he delivered the Gettysburg Address. And this is uh, a, a, one of our tests here. So this is on the left, you see the Gardner image. On the right, you see our set. And we overlay it uh, so that you can see, and, we, and, we, and this was years, literally years of me messing with things and placing them in the set and uh, changing the camera angle of view, changing its field of focus, all of that until we were finally matching up from every view. And this is just to give you a, a quick idea here. Uh, what's happening in this video is, uh, is a blending of those two. I realize we're going over time here, so I'm gonna try and speed this along. Um, so, but I'll, I'll just show this first one so you can see how it works. But you can see our digital world bleeding through now as the other one disappears. And, and if this were not in the right place and if it were not the correct camera angles and all that, none of this would work. And we found that if you move the speaker stand 
just a foot or two away uh, from where it is or change its shape or size, it doesn't work anymore. So we had to make sure it worked from all views. And so here's the view from the gatehouse. I won't go through the video again because then we're over. So, um, but you can see here the progression. I'll pass the video and here's the back rack shot. Um, and you can see again, the uh, image um, turning into our, our image. And, and this one was the hardest one to crack because uh, of the location of everything. But we finally, I finally all fell into place uh, uh, about a year ago or so for me. Um, and I'm just gonna skip along here. There's, um, I've already talked about how you can actually see um, Gardner and, uh, and uh, Weaver both in each other's photographs. We've, we discovered that as well while we were working with this. But the other one I wanted to just talk about one last uh, discovery that we had because in the original scan on the left side or the right side of the, the image, uh, this man on the lower right is, is the image isn't there. The, the, the uh, stuff scraped off the plate. So you can't really see him. So when we scanned the new one, on the left, he came into focus because it's a stereo view. And I just said, I, I, know, I know who that is. And what it is is Alexander Gardner photobombing his own photograph. <laughs> so his assistant uh, had to been taking uh, that photograph. And, uh, and I was showing this to Rob Gibson, a wet plate photography uh, expert. And, uh, and he says, oh my God, and he's even got the cloth uh, for covering the camera over his left shoulder. So um, that's it. Um, I'm going to skip unless people want to see it, the virtual link and uh, the VR experience video. But I do want to get to questions that people have and also let people have an evening. So uh, I want to just thank you again for allowing me uh, to come and, and do this presentation and show you what we're working on and show you how my students and I are, are trying, like all the others throughout history uh, since Lincoln's life, uh, to bring a living Lincoln uh, back into our time. So with that, I'm going to... Oops, I'm going to ask for questions and stop the share. That was phenomenal, Christopher, really. Um, so we're open for questions. Okay, before questions, Chris, if you want to give me your random number to see who gets oh, the book. Yes, yes. Um, I forgot. 28. 28. Uh, 28 is Scott Howland. So uh, Scott, you'll be getting the Lincoln book this week because I just got a message tonight that Scott lives in Hamden, so that'll be personal delivery. Yeah, that works. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. And, um, so um, questions? I think we're all mesmerized right now trying to absorb everything we saw. Phenomenal. So uh, thank you. There is, there is a question. Um, in a chat, Phil, I want me to grab it. Oh yeah, go ahead, Bob. I didn't catch it. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Question from Bob Carlson, uh, Christopher. I'm sure that you've discussed all this research with Gary Edelman, but has he oh, seen yeah. this entire presentation by you? Yes. Yes. And in fact, um, great question. And um, I, I will, I will say this, uh, Gary and uh, Tim Smith are the experts. Uh, they sort of work a lot with Braz and Edo and with, with Braz as we call him. And uh, I've shown it to all of them and I've shared it with them. And I've actually, this last July, when, after the pandemic began, I traveled up to Gettysburg to meet with them all. And I shared with them my results and I got the thumbs up from all three of them. So I was, I was very, very, very excited about that. And so we're, we're planning to try and figure out how, how to get me up there this November and, and, and let the world know uh, where Lincoln actually was to get his address, in our, our opinion. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Uh, Christopher, I don't know if it's a question or a comment or quite what to characterize it as, but the idea of Lincoln being on one side of Seward and then being on the other side of Seward, mm -hmm. could that have been one before the speech and after the speech? Yep. That's one of the things I've been looking into, and and um, I've done a ton of, of uh, investigating about uh, how high the speaker stand was, and and where it was in relation to everything. And this is kind of uh, it's maybe getting a little bit into the weeds, but but um, I was having a problem for a longest time of lining up these photos, 
because it seemed like the speaker stand was a foot to a foot and a half too short. And, and I could make it work from this, but I couldn't get the ground to work. And I mentioned that I sleep in the gatehouse when I go to Gettysburg because of the, the uh, caretaker of Evergreen Cemetery is a very close friend of mine, Brian Kennel. And, and one day Brian and I were walking in the cemetery and I, and I just pointed over to where this, where I thought it was. And I said, Brian, is there a chance that this ground was lower <laughs> in, uh, in uh, 1863? And he says, not only was there a chance of it, it was probable. And I said, why? And he said, well, none of those graves have been dug. So when you dig a grave, you're bringing all that up. And so what tends to happen is that everything gets risen. And, and the way they dig, dug graves for those as well, they weren't as deep uh, to begin with. So they would dig a shallow grave and then pile dirt on top of it and then even fill in all around that. So you'd get this landfill as well. And, and uh, which is more than I ever cared to know about <laughs> the, uh, how to bury somebody in the Civil War, but, but it solved my problem. So as soon as I lowered that ground uh, by about a foot, everything fell into place and all the all the views matched and and uh so i found that absolutely you know absolutely incredible i I'm, don't know if i'm trying to remember if that, what the original question was now no that, that's really fascinating thank you uh christopher the question is have you seen a new program on my heritage genealogy site that brings photos to active life yes i almost put it in the in the presentation but i knew i was going to go probably a little long so i didn't it's actually that's actually very fascinating and i think some of them work better than others and and uh there's actually a few programs that do that uh and for those who don't know there's there's a, a program where you can take a photo of somebody uh, an old photo and, and it will animate them somewhat and give them a little bit of movement. Um, and it's tough with, uh, with people with beards because it tends to erase part of the beard um, or make it stretch and look weird. Um, but I've seen, and I've, I've posted a few on Facebook where, where somebody would do Mark Twain or Lincoln and I think, wow, that actually looked pretty good. Um, so, um, so yeah. Uh Christopher, a quick one for me, and maybe yeah. I missed it during your talk. Um, so the photo that you identified as Lincoln, um, was that taken before his speech or, or after? I might. I think it was. I think it was. I think it was before. I actually think it was when Lincoln was arriving. Okay. Um, now, Bill Bill Frasino disagrees with me on that. He he thinks. Well, I don't think that. You know. I think he's on the stand. And I said, Well, I, this is. Oh, that's what I started to tell uh, Dave was that was that um, in doing the 3D modeling, once I lowered that ground, Lincoln, when he's standing next to the speaker stand, is at the same exact height as the man in that photo. Our digital Lincoln, who's six foot four, six foot five in his boots, uh, you know, when we put him in there, he, it lines up perfectly where, with where he is. So my, my guess is that, in, and because we can also see that the parade is still coming in, uh, and that all the marshals and everybody, the horses, and they're, they're all still coming in in those photographs from Gardner. I think those were test shots taken before the ceremony began. And I think Gardner, and I think the reason there's only three of them is either what he took officially got lost to history, and these were put in some other way because they were just test shots. Um, or, um, you know, he took these photos and realized I, these, I can't get a sellable shot from here, and he, he'd have to pick up and move and maybe miss the rest of it. Uh, or couldn't get close enough. So I think what's happening in that photograph is Lincoln is arriving. I think he is, he's getting ready to get onto the platform. Now, Bob Zeller and, and uh, disagrees with me on that, and, and that's fine. Uh, yeah, you all probably know Bob Zeller and John Richter also found Lincoln in those same photos on a horse, saluting with white gloves and, and all of that. Um, but, um, but, uh, they didn't have access to the high resolution photo I have, and I was able to disprove theirs by uh, using that photo. Um, so, um, and we can talk about that if anybody wants to, but, but, uh, but I do want to say that, that Bob and John are, have been really supportive and helpful to me, <laughs> and, and I don't want to criticize them in the least. Hey, Christopher, there is a question here. Um, mm -hmm. How did you get such high resolution from pictures taken with rudimentary equipment? Great question. Uh, well, it was done in a different way back then. It was wet plate 
you know, collodion photography. So, it, you know, it was, it was uh, a, a chemical process and I think there's eggs and stuff in there. It's just, it's just really, um, uh, it's not done the same way you know, with little bits of silver that we would end up being used for photography for years and years and years. Uh, so what happened is you just get this really nice, clean, pristine image. And these are also the, like the Gardner photos are 10 inch plates, 10 by four. And, and uh, so you're getting a lot of detail in that large photograph. So when they scan that at a high resolution, uh, you can go into something like Photoshop and just blow that up and it'll stay pristine. It won't degrade uh, as, the, as you get in really close. Um, you couldn't do that with today's photography. Digital photography, you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it with uh, um, the old-fashioned photography of you know the of the uh, 20th century. Uh, so so, um, but you can do it with the wet plate photography. You want to get the next question, Dave? Uh, Carolyn, do you want to read your question? Yeah, Chris, um, I know that they're doing scans. Um, is there any degradation in the scans or if you were to uh, be able to examine the glass plate, would you see even more detail if you could um, enlarge from the plate directly? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure, actually. Um, I think the scans that they're using are so, so good. <laughs> um, and, you know, they're going to use the best equipment. Uh, the problem is, is that all of these photographs, and this is where John and, and uh, Bob Zeller got upset because they actually asked for the same image I asked for uh, and were told no. And the reason they were told no is because the, the, the glass plates are in such fragile condition. Uh, you, see, you can see all that flaking uh, that came off of them. They're in such fragile condition that, that uh, they're not supposed to be handled. And the problem was, was that the one I asked for had been mismarked, <laughs> oh, <laughs> had been boy. misnumbered. And, and, um, and I went through an underling. I didn't go through the head of the archives. They had gone through the head of the archives and said, absolutely not. We're not touching this. But I went through an underling and had no idea that they weren't supposed to scan this, this uh, original plate. And uh, unfortunately, it did get slightly damaged. We lost a little bit of the flagpole. Uh, in, in the scanning process. And they told me, we said, we can't do this again because it's the, the plate is too fragile. And I said, no, don't touch it, don't touch it. Stick it in a deep freeze, you know, let it, let it just be, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll live with what we got. And, uh, but you can see the flagpole in the other side of it. So, you know, I would rather gain Lincoln and lose a flagpole. Yeah. Is uh, that the collodion flaking yes. off? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I think, didn't, maybe you know, when Frasnito was originally doing his, um, his uh, research, didn't he go down there and use the uh, original um, glass down at the Library of, uh, down at the um, Library of Congress? Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Back then, back then, they weren't nearly as protective. And, and uh, you know, it was only over time that they realized, oh, man, this is, <laughs> what do we have here, right? Uh, you know, and, and uh, so I, I assume that you could, especially somebody of his stature, um, you know, I, I assume that he uh, had access to anything he wanted. Hmm. Hmm. Well, if you get to, um, if you get to, um, uh, if we actually have a Remembrance Day weekend this uh, year, you're going to have to come to Connecticut uh, brunch. Hey. <laughs> All right. Thank you. The highlight of the weekend. <laughs> you got me. Tell Brian to come too. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, uh, um, I, I have revealed to uh, Fraz where, where I think it was. And it, he's close, um, but, but not right on the money as far as I'm concerned. And I did reveal it to him, and he was just fine with it. Yeah. And, and then, you know, for him, he's he's a true historian. It's not about his ego. It's about getting down to the the, the truth of it. And he said to me years ago when I first met him, uh, he 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 and first did a presentation for my little dog and pony show, flying around the cemetery in the computer. Um, he said to me the next day that he thought all those photos had been picked clean that there was nothing else to be gained from them, nothing else that could be garnered from them at all. And, and what he said to me was, you just showed me that there's a whole new uh, 
uh, area of research that that uh, is is coming up now that could reveal so much more. Well, Alexander Gardner in his own photo, that's phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, I've got I've got even cooler ones to show uh, with that's all going to be part of my larger <laughs> uh, reveal. <laughs> Yeah. When hey, when Chris, can we Chris? expect that, uh, Chris? I'm hoping that'll be in November. Uh, oh, cool. You know, I was trying to do it this last year, uh, but a little thing like COVID came along, and so yeah. um, I'm I'm hoping to do it this, this coming November. And uh, and I'm working with Gary uh, Edelman and uh, to see if we can do it through them. And, oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So so um, you know, and I I would like it to be uh, something. And I also I don't know if you can see it. I'm a member of the Lincoln Forum, so. You know, maybe there'll be something there too, because I always go in November to, to their conferences. So well, good. I hope we see you again. I'm gonna see Gary in two weeks. We're having awesome. a school group come to Gettysburg. So well, tell, um, tell hi for me. When <laughs> Wisconsin's coming, so we'll see them. Cool, cool. Thank you. Christopher, there is a comment from Robbie Cribble. Basically, she says, amazing, would love to see the video. Do you have any idea when the video might be viewable? Uh, the the uh, the video of the actual final project. Your final project, yeah. Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 going to be a mystery. It depends on how long it takes us to get the rest of it together. I may end up just going back to putting it because it's a great backdrop, just so we can move on and be done with mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, I've been with this since two thousand twelve. Uh, so, so, um, it, it's, it's, uh, as much as I am, uh, fixated on it, it does get a little old after a while. <laughs> so you, you've been fixated on Lincoln since you were in kindergarten. What right. do your undergrad students think about working a project involving Lincoln? Uh, what well, was interesting, um, cause they're animation students, they're not historians. And, yeah. and one of the first things I did was I made them all write a paper <laughs> on Lincoln and, and to find something different and interesting to say about him than it has been said a thousand times. And, and uh, so each of them chose to, to research the area that they're going to be doing for the project. So what his hair, his beard, uh, you know, um, you know, his height, you know, how did that affect his life? You know, things like that, who, you know, uh, his marriage, his, his, the deaths in his family. Uh, those are all things that they looked into. And not one of these was a historian. Not one of them was interested all that in history. They were doing this project because they thought it would just be cool. But by the end of that first semester, uh, when I'm giving them the tour of Gettysburg, <laughs> and we're standing where at the, the top of uh, where Pickett's Charge happened, and I'm describing them what's going on uh, with Pickett's Charge, every one of them was just hanging on every word. And of every single one of those students that have everyone, and there's been over 100 students now, that have been through the class. Uh, every single one of them has become a history buff in the process of, of working on the project. And for me, that's one of my proudest achievements. <laughs> uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Do we have uh, more questions for Christopher? Now's your chance. We're caught up in the chat questions. Okay. <clears throat> Any more chats? No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, Chris, thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Chris, I just thank thought you. of one thing. Um, yeah. I don't yeah. know if you can hear me. I can. Um, wonderful presentation. Fascinating. Um, you. you know, I was just struck by the amount of people that are in these pictures and to have such minimal movement that you could zoom in and capture clear images of them. You know, when it, you get a regular picture of just a few people, any slight in, in movement and it's blurred. Yeah. You ever think about that? It just it seems stunning that you have that many people not moving. Uh, well, actually there is a lot of blur in the photos. If you, if you, if you look around the, the crowd, you see a lot of blur. I talked to Rob uh, Gibson, the, the expert in this photography. Uh, he's a photographer, he does it. He's, he's immortalized me many times in, in glass and on tintype and, uh, um, and in costume. Uh, and and uh, I asked him during one of these sessions, I said, well, okay, so how long, how long an exposure do you think this is? And he goes, well, it's outside, it's semi-cloudy. Um, that would have been about four seconds. Oh, that's short. 
So yeah, so and when you're in the studio, it's about 14 or more seconds than that. And, and so, so they do appear to be uh, uh, more still because uh, you know, you'd have to be moving fairly severely uh, in order to, to, to be completely blurred. Though there are a number of them that do look very ghost-like. I would think on the test shots, if they are test shots, that uh, there's nothing to rivet their attention. And so there'd be right. more movement. Right. And what's also fascinating in the Gardner photos is that people are gathered around the camera on the platform posing. <laughs> they all want really? to be photographed. <laughs> so there are, you know, there's a bunch of kids who are standing, sitting there looking up at him. And, and, uh, and there's an older man who's, who's waving, who I think I know who that is. And uh, it's something I'm going to uh, be revealing at also another point. And there's another young man uh, who's posing in one of them. And I think that's Gardner's assistant. Uh, and, and, um, so again, I think the test photos, Fraz completely disagrees with me on this, completely. <laughs> he, th he's, he says, you know, why would they ever, why would Gardner need to take test shots? And I'm like, um, I'm a film guy. <laughs> <laughs> I take test shots all the time. Uh, why not, right? Yeah, so, so you gotta make sure you're in focus. You gotta make sure the focus is working. Uh, he was shooting stereo. He had to make sure both stereo sides, both lenses are, are exactly in sync uh, in terms of focus. Uh, so he had he had reason to. Uh, Want to spin all your plates and then find out it, it, you were blurred from the start. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And Chris, thank you, thank you. Chris, is it true that on the glass plates the center is like when you get out to the edges of the plate, it's mm -hmm. more blurry. Yes. Even, even if it's in focus, somebody to, maybe Gary told me that. Yeah, it, no, that absolutely is true, and you can definitely see it in all of those photos. Okay. Uh, which was something I had to contend with in lining up the cameras. Um, okay. and, and I had to discount what I'm seeing on the edges because I can't trust it. Okay. And, and, uh, and it does. And the, the reason for it is the glass was hand milled back then. So it wasn't machine milled. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, you know, an exact science. Uh, it was such a new process at the time that it was all done by hand. So, so you're going to get some of that variation uh, as you go out to the edges. And it also depends on the length of the lens to the, to the plane of the plate of, 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 uh, of uh, the glass plate. So, um, so, but you are going to get distortion as you go to the side. And it gets worse and worse to almost the point where you can't see what's there uh, if it's a wide shot. Hmm. Thank you. Sure. Oh. Um, love the, it was just awesome. I want to yep. thank everyone for, for being here and of course, especially Christopher. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Very good. Absolute pleasure and an honor to be talking with you all tonight.